Hi everyone, it's Tanya and welcome to today's video. Today's video is going to be dedicated to Charlotte Bronte and the books that she was reading. Some of the books will be the books that she liked and that she enjoyed, that she recommended to her friends and family, and some of them will be the books and authors that she didn't really like and some unpopular opinions of hers. All the information for you today comes from her correspondence and her letter to different people in her life, her editors, her friends and family. I actually started reading this book during October because Lucy from Lucy the Reader had the challenge to read a collection of letters or diaries of Victorian authors and so I found this Oxford collection of Charlotte Bronte's letters and in the very beginning in one of her very first letters she was writing to her friend uh, Ellen Nassi yeah, Ellen, Ellen Nassi Ellen asked her to recommend some some books, which Charlotte did. And that that's when the idea hit me. I kind of started hoping that maybe she would talk about books in the future letters as well. And then I would have enough material for a video, which she did. <laughs> which is thank you very much, Charlotte Bronte, by the way. Because actually, it's sometimes it's difficult to find information about classic writers reading, because there isn't much information, actually. And in case of Charlotte Bronte, she talked about books with other people, which I'm so grateful to her for. <laughs> so today we aren't only going to talk about her favorite book and her favorite authors, primarily authors, because she mostly speaks about authors. We aren't only going to talk about her favorites, but also about her unpopular opinions, because she had some. And I was actually very surprised to see, like, her unpopular opinions. I was like, ho ho! <laughs> I I don't know, I didn't expect it. So I think we will start with her unpopular opinion. And then after her unpopular opinions, we will talk about the books that she liked and authors that she admired. We will start with her unpopular opinions. She had two. So from what I could find, she had two unexpected authors, which I didn't expect her not to like, <laughs> but she didn't. So the first one is Dickens. She was not a fan from what I understand. She wasn't a, she didn't have she didn't say anything like I don't like his writing, but from her kind of reference and the way she talks about he she doesn't talk also much about him. Like there is one writer about whom she just raves. She raves about him in like can you see the blue tops? The blue tops are parts where she talks about that writer. And like a lot. It's like half a letter is she raves about the writer. With Dickens she doesn't really mention him a lot. She mentions him twice. And so I will share with you two of these moments. So the first moment with Dickens comes in her letter to Harley Coleridge. Harley Coleridge was a writer or a poet and she sent him a few of her poems, I think. And she asked about his opinion. However, she didn't tell the man if she was a man or a woman. And so the Hartley Coleridge, he was curious and he was asking her like, what is your gender? Who are you? He was like, you kind of write like a woman, but there is also something from men in you. And so I cannot decide who are you. And so in her letter, she basically says that how can you uh, decide if I'm a woman or a man just judging from my writing and also the passage that she gives him as to my handwriting or the ladylike tricks you mentioned in my style and imagery you must not draw any conclusions from those several young men curl their hair and wear corsets richardson and rousseau often write exactly like old women and bulwer and cooper and deacons and warren like boarding school misses so that's how she describes not only Dickens' sexual writing, also Samuel Warren, Charles Dickens, and also she means James Fenimore Cooper. So three of these writers write like school misses, <laughs> in the opinion of oh, Charlotte Bronte. One more mentioning of Charles Dickens comes significantly later, in 1852, so much, much later in her life. She was talking about Bleak House, so she read the first few chapters of the Bleak House that were published, and that's what she writes. Is the first number of Bleak House generally admired? I like the chancery part, but where it passes into the autobiographic form and the young woman who announces that she is not bright begins her history, it seems to me too often weak and twaddling. An amiable nature is caricatured. 
not faithfully rendered in Miss Esther Summerson. So that's very very small part that she had to say about Bleak House. Basically she thought that his character was caricaturistic, though she actually liked uh, the first part. She liked the part about ch chancery. So that was her opinion about Charles. And then she never really talks about him, like she never mentions him in her letters. One more writer which I didn't expect her not to like and about this writer she goes more into details. She kind of explains why she didn't like this writer. This writer is Jane Austen. She was not a fan of Jane Austen. And so she started with Pride and Prejudice, because that's the book that the author recommended, was not a fan. I will end. Let's see why. <laughs> so here's the letter. The letter was to G. H. Lewis, who was also a writer as far as I understand. So that's what she writes about Pride and Prejudice. Why do you like Miss Austen so very much? I'm puzzled on that point. What induced you to say that you would rather have written Pride and Prejudice or Tom Jones than any of the Waverly novels? Waverly novels by uh, Walter Scott. I had not seen Pride and Prejudice till I read that sentence of yours. And then I got the book and studied it. And what did I find? an accurate portrait of a commonplace face, a carefully fenced, highly cultivated garden with neat borders and delicate flowers, but no glance of a bright, vivid physiognomy, no open country, no fresh air, no blue hill, no bonny back. I should hardly like to live with her ladies and gentlemen in their elegant but but confined houses. These observations will, will probably irritate you, but I shall run the risk. Charlotte Bronte. Mm. I, I'm so curious to read her novels because she is actually very candid in her letters and she is very honest in her letters. Like she, like in here, she isn't hiding it, she isn't trying to be polite, she isn't trying to, you know, kind of be soft. She just tells how it is. She's like, you know what? <laughs> didn't like it. Probably you, it will irritate you, but whatever. <laughs> you see? She, I don't know. I feel like she is interesting. Oh, actually, so this is the first mentioning of Jane Austen. Well, she did after reading Pride and Prejudice. There is one more mentioning after she read Emma. I guess this particular novel, it's not that she didn't like it, she didn't admire it very much, but there definitely were parts that she also enjoyed and that she found interesting. So that's what she says. I have likewise read one of Miss Austen's work, Emma. Read it with interest and with just the degree of admiration which Miss Austen herself would have thought sensible and suitable. Anything like warmth or enthusiasm, anything energetic, poignant, heartfelt, is utterly out of place in commending these works. All such demonstration the authors would have met with a well-bred sneer. She does her business of delineating the surface of the lives of genteel English people curiously well. There is a Chinese fidelity, a miniature delicacy in the painting. She ruffles her reader by nothing vehement, disturbs him by nothing profound. The passions are perfectly unknown to her. She, re she rejects even a speaking acquaintance with that stormy sisterhood. Even to the feelings, she vouches no more than an occasional graceful but distant recognition. Her business is not half so much with the human heart as with the human eyes, mouth, hands and feet. What sees keenly, speaks aptly, moves flexibly, it suits, it suits her to study, but what throbs fast what the blood rushes through, what is the unseen seed of life and the sentient target of death, these Miss Austen ignores. Jane Austen was a complete and most sensible lady, but a very incomplete and rather insensible, not senseless woman. This was her extended opinion of uh, Jane Austen. Basically, yeah, she says that, she, that Jane Austen doesn't write about human nature, about human feelings. She only writes about the exterior of people's lives, 
but nothing about their inner world and she yeah, does, doesn't study their uh, true character I guess that's what what I understand from this and uh, so yeah, basically she's too sensible she's too cold and passions and feelings do not exist in Jane Austen's novels. I myself have only... I'm now reading Emma, so I'm almost finished with, with Emma. I don't know if I agree or if I disagree. I, I feel like I need, I need to read more of other Jane Austen's novels, like Pride and Prejudice, and then we will see. But it's actually inter it's an interesting question if I agree or disagree. Does Jane Austen have passions and feelings? Let me know in the comments if you have read Jane Austen. What do you agree with Charlotte Bronte here, <laughs> or you don't agree with Charlotte Bronte? Actually, there is one more unpopular opinion which I forgot to mention, and this unpopular opinion is actually in the footnotes. It's not in the letter itself. It's kind of just the explanation, because if you remember in the first part where I uh, was mentioning Jane Austen, she was talking about Tom Jones as well. So she was like, "Why would you rather write?" Uh, Pride and Prejudice and Tom and Tom Jones rather than Walter Scott's novels and so in the footnotes it says that Charlotte Bronte disliked novels by Henry Fielding. Tom Jones was published in 7, 1749 and regarded him as cynical and immoral. Charlotte Bronte also disliked Henry Fielding. We will see. I haven't read Tom Jones. I haven't read uh, Henry Fielding so far. I did buy one of his books, Andrew, uh, Joseph Andrew, which is right here. I will give it a try somewhere next year, and we will see how I feel about Henry Fielding. Okay, so these were three of Charlotte Bronte's unpopular opinions. Now off to the authors that she loved and admired and just you know, loved with her whole heart. We will start with her biggest love, I guess. <laughs> no, actually no. First we will start with her first love, first author that she recommended to her friend when Ellen Nassi asked for book recommendations. So that's what Charlotte Bronte gave her. She gave her a big list of books. She gave her a big list of books for poetry, and also for fiction and autobiography and history, she gave her like a whole whole list of books. Out of this list, I will give you uh, poetry, for example. So for poetry, she says, you ask me to recommend some books for your perusal. I will do so in as few words as I can. If you like poetry, let it be first rate. Milton, Shakespeare, Thompson, Goldsmith Pope, if you, if you will, though I don't admire him. Scott, Byron, Champell, Worth, Wordsworth, and Southey. Amid the comedies of Shakespeare and the Don Juan, perhaps the, the Cain of Byron, though the latter is a magnificent poem, and read the rest fearlessly. And then as for fiction, for fiction she only gives one name. For fiction read Scott alone. All novels after his are worthless. So keep in mind that this letter was written in 1834, so it's one of her earliest, you see like the very beginning of the book, one of her earliest letters, because later on, in her later letters, she has one author, which we will be talking about now, and she raves about him, she loves him. So I think she would, she would maybe correct this sentence that like reads Scott alone. The author that she admires and the author that she raves about is Thackeray. First mentioning of Thackeray comes after her publication of Jane Eyre and she received praise from him and so her editor, uh, no not editor, her publisher uh, W.S. Williams, he sent this um, praise to her from Thackeray and that's what she, rep she's, she replies. She replies, I feel honored in being approved by Mr. Thackeray because I approve Mr. Thackeray. This may sound presumptuous, perhaps, but I mean that I have long recognized in his writing genuine talent such as I admired, such as I wondered at and delighted in. No author seems to distinguish so exquisitely as he does the real from the counterfeit. I believed, too, he had deep and true feelings under his seeming sternness. Now I am sure he has. So that was the very first mentioning and that's where I realized that she likes Thackeray. Later on 
I will not re read you all of her praises because you see she has she has a lot like all the blue tops are tops about tech curry and so she really really liked the man later in her life she even attended his lectures so later she also write i have already told you i believe that i regard mr techery as the first of modern masters and as the legitimate high priest of truth and then she specifically talks about vanity fair there is some something a sort of still profound revealed in the concluding part of vanity fair which one generation will not suffice to fathom a hundred years hence if he only lives to do justice to himself, he will be better known than he is now. A hundred years hence, some thoughtful critic, standing and looking down on the deep waters, will see shining through them the pearl with, without price of a purely original mind, such a mind as the Bulwers and his contemporaries have not. And, the, and one more praise that I really want to read to you about Takeri. This is like the... This is the praise, the final praise, where she compares him to Dickens, actually. So, some people have been in the habit of terming him, Takeri, the second writer of the day, the first being Dickens. It just depends on himself whether or not these critics shall be justified in their award. He need not to be second. God made him second to no man. If he were he, I would show myself as I am, not as critic report me. At any rate, I would do my best, but I believe Mr. Tuckery is easy and indolent and very seldom cares to do his best. So basically she believes that he has the potential to be the best writer of his age, but he sometimes may be lazy. She definitely sees faults in his writing but at the same time later she sees as she writes the truth <laughs> and she kind of forgives him the faults that she saw before so for example what i'm talking about she read the, she read the manuscript manuscript for henry estmond uh so one of takeri's novels and that's what she writes about the faults as usual he is unjust to women quite unjust there is hardly any punishment he does not deserve for making this lady peep through a keyhole, listen at a door and be jealous of a boy and a milkmaid. <laughs> Many other things I noticed that for my part grieved and exasperated me as I read. But then again came passage so true, so deeply thought, so tenderly felt, one could not help forgiving and admiring. So, by no means he is a perfect writer, but she is ready to forgive him his faults after reading some of his true and deeply felt passages. So, yeah, Tekiri is the writer that she admired a lot and she wrote about him a lot in his novels. Like, I will not read everything. So basically, yeah, later in her life, Tekiri becomes one of her favorite writers, alongside Scott, because she still, I guess, liked Scott. Walter Scott. One more writer that I want to mention to you is Elizabeth Gaskell. She actually knew Elizabeth Gaskell personally, which I didn't realize. I only realized after reading her letters because she, they were in correspondence, they met, they spent some days together. So she definitely read Gaskell's uh, Mary Barton. She, there is no mentioning of like her opinion of the book. She doesn't talk about this book. She just kind of refers to, in her letters to her friends, she refers to Elizabeth Gaskell as the authoress of Mary Barton. So I guess I assume they probably read uh, uh, Mary Barton, but she doesn't mention it. However, however, she did read the first three stories of Cranford and the, she has an opinion about them which she wrote to Elizabeth Gaskell. So as far as I, as far as I understand, Gaskell's Cranford was published as a collection of stories in Dickens Household Words. So it's like a magazine that Dickens was publishing, publishing. And so that's what she writes to Elizabeth Gaskell. I lately got hold of a bound copy of Dickens's Household Words for, for 1852. 
Therein I have as yet only read three articles to read. Society at Cranford, Love at Cranford, Cranford Memory at Cranford. Before reading them, I, have, I had received a hint as to the authorship, which hint gave them special zest. The best is the last, memory. How good I thought it, I must not tell you. So, yeah, she doesn't go into detail, <laughs> but apparently she liked especially the third story, so Memory at Cranford. So yeah, she read Cranford by Elizabeth Gaskell. One more author that she really liked, she had some good things to say about, was Ruskin. So that's what she has to say, to about, say about the writer first, and then I will give you her opinion on one of his books. So she writes, Mr. Ruskin seems to me one of the few genuine writers as distinguished from bookmakers of this age. His earnestness even amuses me in certain passages, for I cannot help laughing to think how utilitarians will fume and fret over his deep, serious and fanatical reverence for art. That pure and severe mind you ascribed to him sparks in every line. He writes like a consecrated priest of the abstract and ideal. So that's the author. And then she read The King of the Golden River. So that's uh, a short fairy tale, I guess, that Ruskin wrote for children. The King of the Golden River is a divine fairy tale. Richard Doyle has done a scant justice in his illustrations, which are rather obscurations. But it doesn't much matter. Mr. Ruskin paints so exquisitely with his pen as to be almost independent of the designer's pencil. Ruskin. I couldn't find many books by this author currently being published, but however I did find the fairy tale, this the fairy tale that she was referring to. So yeah, maybe he is not as famous author now, but Charlotte Bronte liked him. One more, I guess, already forgotten novel, which I, I don't think I don't think it's published currently. I tried to find it, but I didn't find. I think, I mean, I couldn't find. Maybe, maybe it's somewhere published. But it's the Madeline. Madeline by Julia Kavana. I'm not sure how to pronounce this author's last name. Kavana? Kavana? This author. I will write her name in the screen. So that's what Charlotte said. I have read Madeline. It is a fine pearl in simple setting. Julia Kavana has my esteem. I would rather know her than, main, than many far more brilliant uh, personages. Somehow my heart leans more to her. And actually later she met this authoress. She met her in her house. Charlotte Bronte went to meet the woman because she knew that uh, Julia Kavana also admired her works and admired her novels and so there was an opportunity for them to meet and she came to visit Julia in her house and that's what she writes about the experience. Do you remember my speaking of Miss Kavanagh, a young authoress who supported her mother by her writings? Hearing from Mr. Williams that she has a longing to see me, I called on her yesterday. I found a little almost dwarfish figure to which even I had to look down, not hunchbacked, but long-armed and with a large head and, at first sight, a strange face. She met me half, half frankly, half tremblingly. We sat down together and when I had talked with her five minutes, that face was no longer strange, but mournfully familiar. I shall try to find a moment to see her again. She lives in a poor but clean and neat little lodging. Her mother seems a somewhat weak-minded woman who can be no companion to her. Her father has quite deserted his wife and child, and this poor little feeble, intelligent, cordial things wastes her brain to gain a living. She's 25 years old. This passage made, made me sad. I feel like... And I feel so... Now I feel so bad that her novels have been forgotten, even though Charlotte Bronte, for example, admired them, and she said that the lady was actually intelligent and bright and cordial and everything. I feel bad. 
I, I want now I want to try to find Julia Kavanaugh's novels and try and read them <laughs> to just give the woman you know some memory <laughs> if you find her novels share with me and the last book that I found her read and admire and enjoy very much was Uncle Tom's Cabin you remember me mentioning this book also in Charles Dickens's favorite books I don't know if it was his favorite, but he read it and he said that some parts in this book were admirably done. That was like, I'm, I'm quoting Charles Dickens. In case with Charlotte Bronte, she read this book too, and that's what she had to say about it. She kind of compares herself and her writing to, to this novel, so that's what she says. I cannot write books hang handling the topics of the day. It is of no use trying, nor can I write a book for its moral nor can I take up a philanthropic scheme, though I honor philanthropy, and voluntarily and sincerely veil my face before, before such a mighty subject as that handled in Uncle Tom's Cabin. To manage these great matters rightly, they must be long and practically studied. Their bearings no, known intimately and their evils felt genuinely. They must not be taken up as a business matter and a trading speculation. I doubt not Mrs. Stowe had felt the iron of slavery enter into her heart from childhood, upwards long before she even thought of writing books. The feeling throughout her work is sincere and not got up. She admired also Uncle Tom's Cabin, which I still yet, I'm still yet to read. Hopefully I will read it next year. So, there you have it, guys. A few of Charlotte Bronte's favorite authors and books that she liked and admired. Books that she was talking about in her letters to other people. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was interesting and not too tiresome because obviously I was reading a lot, but I just, I didn't want to talk myself. I kind of wanted her to talk. So that's why I decided to give you as many quotes as I did because, you know, it's always better to hear from the person herself. <laughs> so there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know in the comments what other authors you want to see in this series. For now, I hope you're having a very good day. I hope you're staying safe and I will see you very soon in my next videos. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.